please go ahead and click on that Q&A. And it looks like some questions have already been asked and they've already been answered. Yes, uh, someone was commenting that they enjoyed the information on Bethabra and I think Diana Overby did a great job on con consolidating a lot of information in a short period of time there. Mm -hmm. Oh good, and then, yeah, and then I see that you mentioned that uh, Tom from uh, the archives in Bethania said, Guten Mach, well done. Uh, thank you, Tom, it's very, very nice of you. Um, so what we'd like to do is just open to any questions from the public. So we'd love to hear from you, any comments, any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and ask them. We will look at them. We will either answer these questions verbally, like we're doing now, we will type an answer. Um, we can also fill you in on the rest of the, uh, on the rest of the conference for the, the week and let you know what's up. Okay, so we have someone asking a question. Julia Fallon says, is there a publisher of Moravian fiction? Not, Not that, that I know, I know of. Well, I'll tell you this, there's um, uh, the former yeah, uh, I can archivist at our place. So you got it? Go ahead, Arthur, okay. you got a comment? There are, there are a few really interesting novels um, on Moravian history, but to my knowledge, there is not a specific um, publisher who um, focuses on that. There are publishers who focus on um, publishing scholarly articles, um, both in Germany and here in the United States. Um, question about, uh, from somebody asked if uh, when Moravians revert to farm as plantation, did they meet a large farm? Was this a farm staff with slaves? Not necessarily. Uh, for example, uh, in the, we have a map here showing um, Christian Dunka's uh, place just on the west side of Salem that uh, I would say is about uh, a half acre and he calls it plantage. It's a planted space. Doesn't necessarily mean plantation, although that's one translation of it. It's usually just a farm in the Moravian context. There were um, uh, larger, um, closer to plantation style um, use of enslaved labor uh, in the, at the edges of the Wachovia uh, settlement, but in places like Salem, when you read Plantage, there's a, there is a, a, a plantage for the Wachovia church, which is where they used to, to grow vegetables and, and stuff for the uh, pastors. That was a church on uh, farm. Uh, but most of the time, um, it's not um, a plantation economy, the use of that. Language of the early documents, you know, um, probably till um, 1876, I can say our documents here officially were recorded in the German language because they were sent back to Herrenhut, the headquarters of the Unitas Fratrum worldwide. Uh, locally, um, uh, by about the time of our end of our conference time, 1822, by the time you get to the third generation of folks living in Wachovia, the grandkids and the great grandkids are you start talking more English. Uh, from the beginning, there was one English settlement here, Hope. Um, it was um, primarily English settlers from Maryland, um, but um, the uh, the language officially in our records is German, and that German is a very interesting script. Uh, all three of us have had to take uh, lessons with our friend uh, Paul Boyker up in. Uh, Bethlehem at the Moravian Archives there because the, about a third of the alphabet is substantially different in shape orthographically from the letters that we're used to. So it's a real challenge to read these, these documents. Lots of really good questions today. Let's see. Um, Interesting question, a friend of ours who studies uh, uh, indigenous uh, folks, uh, there's a quote in uh, the Bethabra video uh, that mentions the fact that uh, the Moravians were to uh, withhold from contact with indigenous people uh, as, as a first priority because they had to get their church economy stabilized. At the time they came to Wachovia, the church internationally was having uh, difficulties. Um, is there, are they aware of the Saponi or the Catawba? The uh, Sara, who uh, you know about the Sara area, Sara Mountains just north of us in Stokes County, Rockingham County, Upper Sara and Laura Sara. The Sara had already left this area 
and move south to what's now in the area of Shira, South Carolina. Uh, the Kitab is there. Any mention, my son is also a linguist. He was also answered the same question in the records of the Kitaba. There's not a lot of active mention of the Kitaba here because they were not in the, in the neighborhood. Saponi, likewise, I don't see a lot of mention, but uh, I'd love to have uh, the researcher who asked that question to come take a look and help me find what's here. Ah, did the Moravians take sides in the regulators conflict? You know, the regulators were marched through uh, uh, Bethabra, I guess, when they were arrested. Um, there's a whole series of, of stories about the pre-revolutionary days and the Moravian decision formally to be uh, neutral during the Revolutionary War in a booklet that our archivist Daniel Cruz wrote a few years back called Through Fiery Trials. And it talks about the stories of the Moravian quandary of being, uh, uh, as uh, Dean Gillespie put it, they, they really were not nationalists at all. They were a transnational, transatlantic, worldwide brotherhood of Christ. They were not interested in the idea of, of nationhood the way we later would understand it. Uh, and, and so they did not take a side. They and the Quakers were, were thought of with equal suspicion uh, during those days. But uh, there, is, there is detailed information in that booklet through fiery trials about the revolutionary days. Ah. Okay, so we have another one. Uh, were people who were considered living in Bethania outside, were they neighbors in the way non-Moravians were? Well, Bethania was, uh, was a, a Ortsgemeine. It was a, a, it was a congregation. So they would have been congregants. Uh, they would have been members in that area. Um, the outsiders or the Auswärtigen as far as I understand it, were actual Moravian members who lived outside of a, of a congregation. So outside the town limits of Bethania, outside of Bethabra, or outside of Salem, or outside of uh, Bethlehem. Um, those would have been the Auswärtigen. Um, so they were definitely considered uh, Moravian members, members of a, of a Watskamina, of a, a congregation. question about Bethania. Bethania has got an um, interesting history when the, the Moravian community is here and that it was founded uh, literally half with Moravians and half with non-Moravians who sought shelter there during the uh, what we know as the French and Indian War, the Seven Years War in Europe. And they were worried about attacks from the Cherokee when they founded that town. Uh, and the area and the outskirts of the formal boundaries of Bethania is an area that did have quite a large uh, a uh, number of enslaved persons during the time period of our um, conference. Uh, we'll be talking about that more and questions about Bethania. And I see another question from the same informed person who is very uh, 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 prescient and wanting to know about Zinzendorf's attitude toward indigenous, who he thought uh, that they were the lost, uh, lost, lost tribe of Israel. What do you think of uh, African Americans? Craig. Atwood is going to be talking about Zinzendorf's ideas, and perhaps uh, we'll hear from him on those topics on Saturday morning when we tune in and have a roundtable of scholar discussions. And, and let me just interject here that this conference is um, different. I mean, hey, we're here online. That's different enough. But the conference has that three different components. In the mornings, tomorrow and Friday, there'll be a gathering of scholars that's not open to the public that'll be sharing research papers about different topics, many of which are very similar to some of our good questions we've got already today. Um, and those topics will be explored um, in discussions among the scholars and then they will be summarized Saturday morning by uh, Professor John Sensbach, University of Florida, who wrote a very famous book, uh, Separate Canaan, about the uh, African uh, experience, African American experience here in Salem uh, in the 1990s. He'll be here to summarize the events of that um, uh, discussion over the next two days and let some of the scholars participate and share their observation as well. So the questions about those specifics with Bethany and Zinzendorf bring us back to our expert panel on, on Saturday. I think you'll have some good conversation from that. And uh, 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 fine tuning on in Adelaide's freeze, Mor Moravian records or Bethabra, but Bethania plantations were just farms. Uh, uh, Bethania again is a different creature 
uh, a plantage in Bethania might be nearer to what you call a plantation and the way the economy worked. Uh, but the area is not set up to be a plantation economy. It changes, you know, at the very beginning, the Moravians came here and had a communal economy. That lasted about 10 years or so, and then they switched as people became more independent. And what you'll see in the course of uh, the information from our, co our conference is that probably in Bethany is one of those areas with the pressure to be more American, at least in attitude towards uh, slaveholding, uh, is the greatest because it's at the fringe of the community. It's not at the center of church control. It started out bifurcated between half uh, long-term church members and half uh, recent um, uh, converts. And so it's, a, it's a, uh, a word that has different meanings depending on where you are time-wise and space-wise in Wachovia. But it's a very mm -hmm. interesting point. Yeah, I think the, the issue with the word plantage uh, in German is that it, it changed over time. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, there was a, a major change in agriculture and cultivation mm -hmm. of the land in the 1800s and an adoption more of the practices uh, of the land. And so Pantage by 1810, 1812, 1822, was approaching more the concept of plantation that we think of. I have a question from someone who asked if the Moravians were attacked by Indians like people in Southwest Virginia. Well, they were certainly scared to death of that after those raids happened. And uh, at one time there was a, a, a bill that was shown in, in uh, Diana Overby's video that we have here in the archives. It was submitted by the Moravians to the uh, colonial government asking for reimbursement from feeding Cherokee meals because the Cherokee would come through here on the way up to Ohio to fight with the British against the Shawnee and the French. And then that turned and there was attacks of um, uh, Cherokee at Fort Dobbs near modern Statesville. Uh, people were killed in ambushes near uh, uh, Bethabra and it was because of the fear of ambushes that they put up the palisade around Bethabra and, and, um, um, and had so many people from the frontier beyond the Wachovia come to that place to settle. There were actually probably more people who were non-Moravian down near the dam uh, below Beth uh, Bethabra for a while because of those fears of Indian uh, indigenous attacks uh, than um, there were Moravians at the time. But yes, there was a fear of that, um, but uh, not attacks itself on Moravian settlements. And Eric, I don't know if you saw the question there about finding the documents that were in the Bethabra presentation. I think you could probably offer a pretty good answer for that. No, a lot of, um, uh, we've mentioned several times, I was looking at the video today and struck again how often we refer you to those uh, records of the Moravians in North Carolina, which are uh, translated English, uh, translated into English excerpts from the church diaries and church records. And I, I'll have to go back and check that specific reference to young warrior neighbors in the hollows, but my guess is that's also from the records of Moravians um, because those are translations of church diaries, um, church um, minutes uh, between administrative boards, uh, a grab bag of personal correspondence and diaries. Um, Adelaide Fries did an amazing um, uh, I would say it, it, you can imagine the birds that you've seen, maybe some of you, the bird's eye view in 1891 or 92, I guess it is, of Winston and Salem. Uh, Adelaide Fries does a wonderful job of giving you a bird's eye view of what our documents contain. She doesn't translate everything. I think, Grant, you found out what the Salem Diary of 1817 translation she gives is only about 20% of what's there. Yeah, that's um, right. yeah, yeah, I think you could say a quarter. And yeah. He does a good job of translating a lot of the interesting things, historically significant items, but a lot of what she doesn't translate, which I find really interesting as a literature person, is the pietistic uh, religious language in German. Um, and that, that is extremely difficult to translate, and so I can maybe understand why she did try to translate it. Uh, pietistic language uh, in general is difficult to uh, understand. Um, but yeah, there's, there's three quarters of the, of the diary is not translated. You know, I, 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 I really am impressed with uh, how well you all are negotiating uh, the Zoom stuff today. This is a complicated task we're asking of you. you think about, uh, we're used to watching our televisions picking up the remote, one click, we get a thing. We're asking you today to 
to tune in and uh, use different links to go to different parts of our program to go back and refer to these videos. And I really appreciate your uh, hanging with us as we're all trying to learn this technology together. But it's great that in the middle of all this isolation we've suffered for so long with COVID that we can get together and talk about cool things on a wonderful fall afternoon. So thank you for that. Yeah, and actually we are probably uh, engaging more people than we would have in a live conference uh, right now. We have roughly 38 uh, people uh, attending right now. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, I got a question from someone in Bethania who says hello and uh, talks about that there were orchards uh, near there and were there large tracks uh, near Old Salem. Uh, in Diana's presentation, you saw the planting of um, apple trees all around Bethabro because um, one of the big products they sold at that tavern was apple brandy. And so they need a lot of apples to do apple brandy. Uh, there's a large um, uh, farm run by the Single Brothers here in Salem, west of town, um, that uh, provided agricultural products for the, the village here at Salem. So there were large uh, tracts of agricultural uh, land near these settlements. Although the Bethania situation, if you'll go, um, our friend Michelle Williams, uh, uh, they currently closed her uh, visitor center, uh, but she still works with historic Bethania there, and hopefully they'll reopen soon after COVID. But Bethania is laid out in a um, uh, kind of a tip, prototypical agricultural European style village where you've got a central street and the the allotted land for farming is directly behind the folks. It's away. So they're, they're all crunched together housing wise, but their farms are back behind the houses. It's a, kind of a unique arrangement. Hmm. So were the Scots Irish considered neighbors? I would say yes. Um, in the records in the diary, I have found several references to Irish settlers. Um, and one thing that several of the pastors did, or the ministers did, is they would travel to some of these settlements outside of Salem or outside of Bethabra and visit some of these settlements in order to preach. And they would refer to them as their neighbors. So they would say we went to uh, our neighbors, uh, the, the Irish, across the Muddy Creek, and we preached to them. So I'd say yes. Well, uh, being Scott Irish myself, I'll have to just take a pass. I hope we're considered neighbors. Um, but it is funny. Uh, we had a, a, a request a couple of years back from folks who were redesigning the um, Greensboro um, Battleground Park. Um, and they were interested in, in Adelaide Freeze's translation of the original um, settling party, settlement party coming down the path, what would be the Great Wagon Road or near it anyway now, um, from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. And they were quite chatty about the Scott Irish and, and uh, uh, all these other different ethnic groups from Europe that were passed along the way. So part of our conversation will be, although our focus in our themes uh, in the papers is uh, looking at the relations between um, uh, Moravians and indigenous and African Americans, it also takes place in the backdrop of um, uh, a variety of different uh, European cultures that settled here. Uh, when the Moravians first got here in Bethabra, uh, they were so blessed to find a number of German speaking um, compatriots here from the home country, and uh, they helped ease their transition into Wachovia by showing them where an abandoned cabin was, by getting them a, a wagon load of uh, pumpkins, by helping them get connected to who was in the neighborhood. And so um, you know, we'll be looking a little bit at those connections between uh, the European neighbors as well. <laughs> I think a, a very interesting connection to explore further is the use of alcohol because there was a great um, controversy about Scots-Irish drinking quite a bit and um, also the alcohol trade and that would also relate to relationships with native people as well. So maybe we can go into that topic a little bit later in our conference. 
I have a question from someone who says approximately how much material did that laid freeze that, that what she had access to and she was responsible for the first seven, I think, volumes of our records of the Moravian series. She uh, started in 1922. I think she ran her, that series goes to about uh, 1947 or eight. Uh, she was in the middle of a volume when she passed in 1949 and Douglas Wright's finished that volume. We continued that series up till uh, Daniel Cruz worked on volume 12 and 13, I think through finished it in 2006 to get us to 1876. But of all the records that we've got, how much was translated? Well, um, I would not be surprised if the number totally is not any greater than what Grant's experience was in that Salem diary of 1817. I would bet she only got to about 20%. Um, I, I would ask when I took this job a few years ago, how many pages of, of stuff were there? Uh, and I was told a million, which sounded like somebody didn't want to count. After looking at it for a couple of three years, it might be a million. There's a lot of pages in there. Uh, some of it is not legible uh, because of uh, environmental damage or, or inks running together over time. The single brother's diary in parts is very difficult to read. It just blurs together. Um, but many of the records are in really pristine shape and it's a pleasure to have them and to be uh, custodians of those records and to look forward to scholars like Grant and Norica and, and many of our folks here today to come use and translate some more of them so that uh, Moravians and, and other folks in the area who are interested in what these records hold can learn more about them. And that's one of the reasons we're excited to be part of this conference as we facilitate that kind of work. So Riddick Weber asks, um, and he's actually going to be one of our research uh, members on this uh, conference. Uh, he's from uh, uh, Bethlehem. He asks, uh, do you think not translating the pietistic language was that it was difficult or that uh, she was embarrassed by it and did not want to translate it? My guess is she was translating with an eye toward the English secular audience and just decided to leave it out because of that. I think she certainly was capable. She's a very good translator. I don't think she would have had too much difficulty doing it. Um, but I do think that uh, trying to provide a historical uh, record of the more historically interesting events is what she was trying to capture. Mm -hmm. And I think that really uh, led her decision. Mm -hmm. So Grant, maybe you can link that to another question from our participants about other Christian and non-Christian influences on um, the identity that was constructed during that time in the Moravian community? Well, so if I understand the question, is there the Christian identity in the Moravian community was very much that that community lived uh, in service of Jesus. Um, their Christian identity was complete in that sense. Is that what you mean by your question? Um, when you read the question is, I could rephrase it if I understand it correctly, but what about other Christian groups, you know, such as Catholics? We know there were Catholics living in Old Salem. I mean, there's again the Irish connection perhaps, um, possibly, but then also what about non-Christian um, influences? For example, we know that many um, enslaved, generally speaking, um, were already exposed to Islam. So we could create the hypothesis that um, as the um, enslaved communicated with each other, that ideas were circulating about other forms of monotheism. Um, what about Jewish neighbors? And what about indigenous spiritualities? And how did they affect Moravian concepts of neighbor? That's a, a really good question. I don't know if I could answer that uh, here. I will say that in general, they referred to uh, any other religion outside of Christianity as heathenism um, and as heathen. And that was obviously their goal to bring them away from that, uh, that religion and present them with the gospel, um, which they held as the, as the tr one true religion. Um, Interesting question uh, yeah. about uh, 
where the idea come from that 1753 group was settling in the wilderness? Yes, there were folks around. There was a lot of folks. Uh, a lot of folks. Here's what's here's the problem. A lot of folks. Um, when they picked the site for Bethabara, they did it knowing that they were 50 miles away from somebody else selling some of the similar goods. Um, the, the county seat, Salisbury, I think might have had 35 persons there at the time when, when uh, Rowan County was started. The numbers of people are small. One of the things we can track very uh, precisely because of the great map work that was done by Reuter and some of the early uh, surveyors from Raven communities, we, we know who was there um, uh, and we who know who owned the land. Now, uh, uh, if you look in 1753 in the, um, I guess it, 1753 when we started, by the time there's a, there's a map by Mouton, I think it is, um, in the 1770s um, that shows that uh, we are at the edge of uh, uh, still the settlement towns and stuff for Northwest North Carolina. It takes a while to get going up here, but the settlement in North Carolina uh, took off thanks to Governor Dobbs, uh, who was an investor in the North Carolina colony uh, before he became governor of North Carolina and uh, was trying to sell land to sell uh, to folks to come move to the state. There was a lot of effort to settle the Piedmont. Uh, and um, of course, Granville himself was the one that sold the Moravians their 100,000 acres or just under that uh, to start Wachovia. So it was wilderness by the standards of density of population. It wasn't totally uninhabited because there were indigenous people here um, and there were some Europeans. Uh, but it was not uh, a happening, hopping place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. We have so many good questions and I'm watching the time and I'm afraid we can't really answer them all, but I would like to respond to the question um, that asked, to what extent, if any, did the Moravians attempt to learn the language of the indigenous people and learn anything about their customs, traditions, and religion? Did they record anything they learned? Since the North American natives did not have a written language, what we know about the history is recorded by early Europeans on first contact with them. And so there, there are many, many long answers uh, that belong into this, into this big domain, but I would like to congratulate the Moravian Archives for just recently having won the 2020 Cherokee Nation Wooster Award. And the reason for winning this prestigious award is because the archives uh, do have an enormous um, collection of entries on um, indigenous peoples. And um, in particular, the series, Eric, that you might wanna talk about that um, records the contacts between the Moravian missionaries and the Cherokee people. So Eric, take it away. Uh, yeah, this, um, uh, your question actually would be an excellent one to ask of our panelists on Thursday night who are representatives from the Cherokee Nation because it's an, uh, there are many stories of Cherokee history written down past through oral culture. Uh, just because some, uh, 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 culture doesn't have a written language doesn't mean they don't have a memory. They don't have stories about their own history and that's certainly the case with Cherokee. Um, uh, it was uh, at about the time that the Cherokee um, the mission started with our, our Moravian missions uh, to what in Spring Place, what is now Georgia, what was then uh, Cherokee uh, territory in Northwest Georgia. Um, uh, that started in 1801, and it was in the 1820s that Sequoia uh, used the syllabary and they published the Cherokee Phoenix, and uh, there started to be a written language for the Cherokee. But there's a lot of um, stories in Cherokee traditions uh, that the Moravians. Uh, will make reference to or, and, and that the Cherokee have preserved themselves in oral culture. So but we're blessed that the recent award is, um, uh, we've gotten our work now with up to 1838, volume 10 is coming out uh, this fall, look for that. Uh, and then the next volume 11 will actually document the experience of Moravian missionaries as they proceed uh, the Trail of Tears and their experiences there, Cherokee arrive and Indian Territory in 38 and 39. So look mm -hmm. forward to reading more about this story. 
Thank you, Eric. I would like to add one point, and that is that uh, as far as we can um, reconstruct that and learn from Native peoples, Native peoples have always been multilingual. So no matter what settlement you would go to, um, you would always find speakers of uh, multiple Native languages. And so it was very easy for Native people to pick up English. Um, as a matter of fact, the Cherokee Mission Schools um, had the, um, the, the purpose to teach Cherokee students uh, the English language and very, very quickly that translated in native peoples writing in English. And it started um, already on the East Coast uh, years before the Cherokee missionaries um, opened their schools. And so when you talk about native writings and ethnographies and pamphlets and hymns and all of that, always keep in mind that English was used very early on as well. Eric, I don't know if you noticed the question about uh, uh, Friedberg and the- Yes, I just told that person to add, send me that question. I'll give her some details. There's lots of okay. brethren in churches. There's a whole bunch in um, South Texas. It's funny, I went with my son down to Austin and all of a sudden I start seeing brethren this and brethren that. And there's some German uh, immigrants and, and, and variants of the uh, uh, our brethren churches in Texas. So. Um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, as a, uh, I have a feeling that's a question that also our, our, our friend Craig Atwood, who's the uh, theological expert for the Moravian Church and joining us on Saturday morning, can give you a more succinct answer. But I've asked her to send me that question to my email and I'll answer it in more detail after uh, offline. Yeah. And then I don't know if you also saw the question about the, uh, the wilderness. Quote unquote. Yes, that's what I was talking about. That wilderness is a relative term. Uh, one of the, the things with our records is that um, it's sort of like if there are 20 people in the neighborhood and you know all 20 people, it's, the records seem crowded, but that may be about it. So uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the area had um, settlers. One of the things that the reason that they had such an intense job of uh, surveying the land is that trying to prove or claim the land ownership there wasn't, a, there wasn't anybody around, the law wasn't around, you had to, you documented, you sent it back to uh, the colonial authorities and you hoped and prayed that things were defensible. You know, the Moravians had a claim, they owned the land um, in what was called at that time Mulberry Fields, that was part of the, uh, maybe a, a thought of as an initial first place for Wachovia to be, was up near Wilkesboro and now buried under Carr Lake up there. And for 50 years, they had a court case trying to figure out, in fact, if they had title. And finally, they ended up settling it by just saying, okay, yeah, you got title, but let's just give a bunch of money to Chapel Hill and, and, and we'll forego the, the title and we'll forego any penalties and let them pay some money to Chapel Hill to start the university or to help the university. Massive court cases because it was difficult to prove ownership in this early days of settlement in the colonial frontier. And it looks like one last question. Um, we can probably answer this one, then maybe close out this session. Mm -hmm. The people of Bethania also come to construct Salem as the Bethabra people did. In the records I've come across, it seems like the majority of the people came from Bethabra. Um, it would not surprise me, however, if there were also members coming from Bethania. Um, there was another question about the relationship between Bethabra and Bethania. If they considered Bethanians neighbors, well, they would have absolutely considered them neighbors, but also members. Um, but the differences that arose between Bethania and Bethabra, and I think you've spoken a little bit about that, Eric. Do you want to say anything else about the peculiarity of Bethania and its members and why there might have been conflict or disagreement between Bethabra and Bethania? You know, I think um, uh, there's a, a great reference book I'll, I'll write you to. In addition to telling you the stories of, of, of instances of um, uh, uh, conflict when, you, when you've got folks who did not grow up in the in the church and, and come into the church and then their their kids come in and grow up. 
um, the um, second and third generation effect gets amplified a lot quicker than when the church has been a multi-generation tradition. We have some of our Moravian families who go back to the founding Moravian settlements in Europe and their families came over to Wachovia and others uh, joined the church along the way and they've got different and they, they, they opt out. A lot of the families um, that came into the church in the, in the time period that we're talking about started to get flustered with the church's rules about getting married where you had to get your marriage approved by lot. Uh, if the Lord said by lot that you were allowed to get married, you could get married. And if they didn't, then uh, you couldn't at that time. And uh, folks got flustered with it and, and uh, went around it and broke rules. And eventually they stopped that practice in 1819 for marriages. But um, uh, there are some interesting stories within the records of the Moravian series, but also uh, Daniel Cruz and Richard Starbuck did a history of the Southern province in 2000. Too, I guess it was, with Courage for the Future, which kind of summarizes all the stories. If you, if you sat down and tried to read 13 volumes of records, which is what we've now got published and available online, that's a lot of stuff. But, but Daniel and Richard narrow it down to some themes. And part of that is discussion about the occasional squabbles that folks in Bethania had with uh, Bethabra, just because they were itching to uh, be different. And, and in fact, what happens is in the beginning of the 18th century, Bethania takes off economically, it becomes a much more prosperous town. It's the end of uh, the plank road for a while. Um, uh, Bethabra uh, dwindles out and, uh, and, and, and fades away. So um, the, the fates of these two towns change economically during the course of our time period. And that also factors into some of their attitudes about how much the Moravian traditions they wanna follow. So I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you for Aren't you excited by these questions? We, we yeah. have some we have there a is, knowledgeable fan base here. I'm yes, sorry, I'm using that term. Like, but wow. but but it, oh, I know there's a lot of fans. I, I I'm blessed in this job to, to hear from Moravians and, and people who have family members in the Moravian community all the time. And they're very committed to learning the details because there's so many great details to learn about. And what's interesting about this conference is you're going to have folks who don't necessarily have those family connections who look at the same records and asking different questions of them. And they'll, they'll force you to look when you go back and look at these records again and see other stories that are right there in front of you that you might have missed when you're looking to read the records from only one particular mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, one very important question we haven't answered yet, and that is how authentic are the Moravian sugar cakes? But I think we we'll leave that for a future um, question and answer period. So. I, I think that one needs further research. I suggest you <laughs> buy us one tomorrow. We'll try it out, okay? Well, we shall see about that. But what I would like to say in closing is that we look forward to having you with us tonight. Seven o'clock, we have a very, very special event for you. Um, our colleague at Winston-Salem State, Professor Andre Minkins, who is a director of the theater program there, has put together especially for our conference, a play to explore the relationships right here um, between enslaved African-Americans, um, indigenous peoples, and the Moravians. So I hope you can join us for that. After that play, we will have a very similar Q&A in which the solo artists and um, Professor Minkins will be available to reflect with you on this very powerful aspect of becoming a neighbor. So thank you so much, and we'll see you at seven o'clock. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.